Well, it'd help if I shared my screen. There we go. Okay, so today's training is going to be over the pregame and the pregame mechanic. There's a lot of information in this, and if you want to chime in, just something you've done in the past, please do, please do chime in. So first things first, I want to go over some Arbiter items. Um, we use Arbiter as our main assigning system. One of the biggest things before the season starts is to make sure that you are ready to be assigned. When you sign into the Arbiter portal, there's a little box on the very, very front page of the dashboard that says ready to be signed. Make sure that it is clicked and you are ready to be assigned. Uh, you, will not, you won't be assigned any games if you aren't uh, ready to be assigned on the main uh, front page of the portal. The other thing is knowing where to go to access in case you're in multiple associations. So for instance, if you click on your on the top right, <clears throat> you'll have a drop down menu. And all you'll do is you'll hit where it says Tennessee Scholastic Lacrosse Association and you'll hit official and that'll take you to your officials dashboard. You can all, everyone can click on US Lacrosse, the official, uh, your officials dashboard through US Lacrosse. Uh, to be honest, I've never actually done that. It, it, I don't think it offers you very much. You're not gonna be assigned to US Lacrosse. You're only gonna be assigned to the Tennessee Scholastic Lacrosse Association. Uh, next thing is making sure your profile is up to date. One of my biggest things with this is making sure you have a picture of yourself on your Arbor account. It doesn't have to be fancy, but having a picture on your Arbor account will allow all your partners to know what you look like in case you have not met them before. Um, so please go in there and make sure that you have a picture, make sure it's an appropriate picture, uh, either of you officiating or of a nice picture of just yourself. Uh, please try to get that updated before the season starts. Uh, phone numbers, address, all that information is very, very important. So just make sure it's up to date. Next thing is if you click on the schedule icon, it'll take you to your schedule for the season. Uh, this is just a screenshot of my schedule. It still has my stuff from last season on there or two seasons ago on there. I'm not sure why, but it'll bring up your master schedule. <clears throat> and this is how you'd be able to see all of your events. Now we do use an Arbiter app. The Arbiter app is free. Um, you don't have as, you can't control as much through the app. The, the, the portal on a desktop computer is a lot more, uh, a lot more information is available to you, but this is how <coughs> you'll accept or decline your games. Uh, basic information is given. You will not be able to see who your partners are on the game until you accept the game. Uh, biggest thing with your events is accepting them in a timely manner, not sitting on them for several days. Next big thing that needs to be accomplished and finished right now is your blocks. Going in and completing your blocks is the most important aspect before the season starts. So this is the block page of Arbiter. You can see that's, those are my blocks for, uh, the, for January. Uh, myself, I'm a high school teacher. So part of the block system, oh wait, part of the block system is just to make sure that think ahead at least one or two months ahead of time. If you're going on a family vacation, block it out where you cannot be assigned. Uh, just stay on top of it. Next thing is the lists icon, which lists all the officials in the state, as well as several that are out of state that also work in Tennessee. So if you want information on the officials that you're with, you can either access that through the game that you've been assigned or through the lists portal in Arbiter. Okay, creating your blocks. Uh, biggest thing is accountability, setting your blocks early and not turning back games, especially if you're a brand new official or new to the state, don't turn back your blocks. Uh, it, it shows the assigners that you want to be assigned, you want games, don't turn back the games. Uh, Professionalism, maintaining a viable block history and planning ahead will help you get bigger games during your career and during the course of the year. Cancellations, cancellations of games, they happen on both our end and on the team's end, and they happen. It's, it's the way it is. Life happens. Just communicate with your assigners ASAP. I know I had, 
I think I had a game last season that I had to call out of the day before. And luckily there was some, some people available to take it, but just call your assigners ASAP for middle Tennessee. It's Jeff Starin and Vincent Giannatasio for uh, Knoxville. It's Damon, uh, not, not Damon, Dean Rivkin. And then for Memphis is Damon and uh Chris Mostetler in Chattanooga is uh, Jeff staring as well. Emergencies, emergencies happen to everyone when they do follow the protocol. Call your assigner ASAP. Don't just turn back, don't sit on the game where it's open and then all of a sudden you realize you can't do it. You know, just call your assigner, tell them what's going on. They'll take you off the game. Uh, a big thing on, on my end that I like to see, and I know a lot of assigners like to see, is notes. If you block a day, uh, put a note in there with a reason why you're blocking it. If you're going on a vacation, put that you're going to be out of state. Uh, even if you do a partial day block, put in there what it is. So if you work from nine to five o'clock, put in there that you work from nine to five o'clock. And I'll, I'll get that, that question in a second. Put in there that you work from nine to five. Uh, you'll see a, a picture of what I always put into my partial block days. Uh, having a simple explanation under your block helps out the assigners, especially if it's a partially blocked day. I know that I've been called up because I have a partial block day, maybe going to five o'clock. Hey, can you do a game at five o'clock? Well, yes, I can. Thank you for giving me enough notice. And so that can pop up for you. Let me get this question really, really quickly. Uh, Dean says, Alex White. Oh, Alex is also a co-assigner in, in Knoxville. That is spot on. I'm, I'm sorry I missed that. Uh, so back to the blocks. In order to set your blocks, on the left-hand side, you'll have the actions. So if you set, I want to set a full block day, partial block day, if you want to clear bot blocks over a certain period of time or add notes, this is where you do it in the action section. So let's just say we set a block, a partial block day. After the partial block day, you're going to go to your time, the time of your, <laughs> the time that you're, the range of why you're setting this block. So my normal day, I set a, a block from seven o'clock in the morning to 3.30 in the afternoon. And I set that every single weekday. So that's my partial block that I set for all work days. Then you put the date range. So I have my partial blocks going from, January 18th, all the way until May 24th. I think that's what I set my partial block days as. After you set your date range, you're gonna go in and pick the days in which you want to set those days. So mine is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday are my partial block days. So I click Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. After that, you can add notes to your partial block. So you can see, for instance, uh, I think I clicked on the, the 18th of January for this block, and it says I work as a high school educator. I can take off with enough notice to find a substitute. So it's just a very, very simple explanation of what exactly the block is. The partial block days are the peachy colored ones. Uh, the dark red are the full block days, which means you cannot work. Blue are assigned games. Uh, light blue is pending games. So all these right here, these are all of our trainings and meetings that are happening in January. So those are my assigned events that are, are on uh, my schedule. So please go in and get these blocks put in if you have not done it already as quick as you possibly can. Assignments are already going out uh, for the month of January. So please go in and set these blocks so that you can be assigned games. Now, uh, Dean, if you want to chime in real quick, uh, if you see someone has not blocked, uh, has no blocks in their schedule, do you normally assign them to games if they have not put any blocks in for fear that they're going to come back? Uh, they show available. Right. I'll uh, assign them. So if you don't have a block put in and you have uh, something going on, on Saturday and you don't put it in, just like Dean said, it'll show that you're available and he'll assign you. And turning back that game does not look good on your part when you could have put the block in beforehand. So just be very, very proactive uh, and don't decline your games if you do get them unless it's absolutely necessary. 
So important terms before we get into our, our, our big pregame stuff. <clears throat> On official is the official who's watching the ball. Off official official who's watching the action from the ball. In the uh, two-man and three-man game, you have the lead official. Primary responsibility is the goal area. Trail officials to stay behind the play and help out with the uh, play between with the ball between him and the lead official. He'll have the four-second goalie count. Transition counts. We have the 20-second clearing count to the midline, 10-second count to enter the box. And the goal area, the 35 by 40 area around the goal and the attack on the attack end of the field. For this preseason, just like any season, your checklist first should start with getting, get, getting into your rule book. Um, I have a paper copy of my rule book, but I also have a PDF copy on iBooks. I love the PDF copy of it because I can command F and find any word that I'm looking for. If I want a specific word or a specific phrase, I can type it in and find that specific phrase. Um, if you have the NFHS app on your phone, you can actually have the rule book on your phone. So you don't have to carry around a paper copy of the book. I think the NFHS uh, e version of the lacrosse book is $5.99. So if you want to have a copy PDF form on your phone, the NFH app is a great way to go. But having your uh, a paper copy is wonderful just because you can highlight and you can tab. I know mine is just riddled with highlighter right now. So getting into your rule book now before the season starts. Next thing is having the correct uniform. As officials were required, we need to have short and long sleeve shirts, black shorts and black pants, black shoes, black belt, scorecards with pencils, a timer, flags, whistle, black hat with white pinstripes. These are what we're required to have on the field. Now for new officials, if, if, if you have a veteran official on your field and you don't have a timer, you just let them know. That, that's, it's one of those things and as you start working games, start making a little bit of money, then you can start purchasing all that, all that, all those items. Big thing is you're going to have this stuff for years, years and years and years. And I know myself, I add to my collection every single year, a new shirt, new pants, maybe new shoes every year, every other year, you'll have it for a long time. So it's, it's a great investment um, throughout your uh, career as an official just to keep updating your equipment and not make it look like where it's really, really old. Next on the checklist is to check your email and the Arbiter app constantly. If you, do, if you have uh, the email that's registered with Arbiter, if you do not check it that often, maybe it's time to change your email and Arbiter to something you will check often. Uh, that is one of the big things I think that will really keep people from getting more games is not checking your email. You don't see a notification that you've been assigned a game and you leave it open for too long. So let's make sure that we have our email uh, and Arbiter app up to the ready and you have your notifications <laughs> turned on for that. Uh, the other thing with Arbiter is when you put your phone in, it'll send you a text message. As soon as you get a text message with an event or with a game that you've been assigned to, add that, that number to your contacts as Arbiter so that you see it when it pops up onto your phone. Uh, next thing is the referee on the game will reach out to both teams, coaches, and all other officials through email at least 24 hours in advance. Now we're not doing the old college rule where the other two officials need to call the referee. No, 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 the referee needs to be, one, be the one that reaches out to everyone. Now this is 24 hours in advance and uh, in our trainings coming up, the, T, uh, the statewide trainings, uh, Jeff is going to be going over the email format that we're going to be sending to all of our coaches, but the referee is responsible for this. Now it's 24 hours in advance. The maximum that you should be sending these emails out should probably be no more than three days before. Uh, we do not want to see officials sending out, okay, well, I got to sign 10 games. I'll send every single email right now. When you have a game that's three weeks away, the coaches need to have that email. Send the email out between 72 and 24 hours in advance. This is, this will be part of a observations thing. So if you are observed on a game, that's one of the things on the checklist is sending that email. Um, there are several, uh, there's two games right now in the preseason where there's been assigned observers to games. So uh, there are gonna be games throughout the season where someone will be assigned to the game as an observer. 
And so just be ready for that to occur. And that's part of the observation is making sure that email is in place. Uh, biggest thing I think on my list is, is, is check the weather of your game and always bring everything with you. You never know, sometimes there might be a crazy rainstorm or ice. Uh, I, I had a game uh, three or four years ago and it, the night before I went to sleep, nothing, woke up and there was three inches of snow on the ground. So check the weather for your game and when you have your uh, official's bag, bring everything with you. I know if people forget a whistle uh, on games that they're with me, I give them a pink whistle so they can use a pink whistle. So um, just make sure you have everything with you and check the weather. Uh, next thing is know your part, know where you, uh, your partners are meeting up before the game. Uh, most of us know the layouts of all the schools we're attending or we're going to officiate at. So let your partners know, hey, we're gonna meet in the upper parking lot or hey, we're gonna meet uh, right here, uh, right next to this, uh, the gym building over at Father Ryan. You know, just say like, where you're going to meet for your pregame. Uh, another thing, and it's a big pet peeve on my list, is walking onto the field together uh, when possible. Sometimes people are stuck in traffic and we gotta get the pregame going. It, it is what it is, stuff happens. But walk on the field together. Uh, there really should not be an official on the field an hour before the game chatting with coaches when the other officials are in the parking lot. Walk onto the field together. Uh, U.S. lacrosse requires us to be on the field 20 minutes before the game starts. So be punctual. Show up a little bit earlier. When your referee says, hey, let's meet up at, you know, uh, 615 for a seven o'clock game in the parking lot so we can pregame for a little bit. Walk onto the field together. Uh, one of the biggest things when you walk on the field together is match. If one person's wearing a jacket, everyone wears a jacket. You should always match your partners. If your partner's wearing long pants, everyone wears long pants. Uh, they're the rules with uniforms. You can wear short sleeves and shorts, but you can't wear short sleeves with pants. You can wear shorts and long sleeves and long sleeves with pants, but you cannot wear short sleeve shirts with pants. It doesn't work that way. If one person is going to wear a jacket, everyone needs to wear a jacket. Match the entire game. If uh, the first half is super, super cold and you want to wear a jacket for the first half, Halftime, you're warmed up, you take the jackets off, awesome. Everyone needs to match when they're on the field. It's part of our professionalism. Next thing is exit the field and leave the location at the same time. Once the game is over, our jurisdiction is, has ended when we leave the field to play. Leave the field together. We don't wanna leave one of our partners stranded on the field at any time, so leave the field together. Uh, we have hey, a question real quick. Does someone have anything to say? Yeah, Gene. And this is Bradley. Um, contacting the coaches. This is something new for me. We don't do that up here in Virginia. Could you expound a little bit as to what information is shared with the coaches when that contact is made with the R? So the I'm, I'm going to stop this share real quick. This is a good place to have a have a have a chat. Okay. So um, for the coaches' uh, email that we're going to be sending out. For example, I sent a, uh, an email to uh, Jeff so he could use an email format for the trainings for this week, for the statewide trainings. Basically saying, you're gonna send the email to the coaches of both teams, head coach away coach. Coach so-and-so and coach so-and-so, my name is Gene Hudson. I'll be uh, officiating your game uh, at R like Ravenwood High School versus Briarcrest on you know, February the 6th, 2020 at 4 p.m. My partners, so-and-so and so-and-so and myself will be, out, uh, uh, will, will be on campus at, like I said, 4 o'clock. So we'll be on campus at 3.15. We'll be on the field at 3.30. Uh, we will uh, meet with you first, meet with your game administrator, and then we'll have our pregame uh, game administrators meeting at uh, 15 minutes before the game starts. So it's basically laying out a schedule before the game occurs. Uh, and then you'll end it with uh, 
Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Please let us know if there are any changes to the schedule or any changes to the game. Uh, and, and that's, it's a very, very short, very sweet email. N now, uh, unlike college where we have places to change, most high schools don't offer us a place to change. So we're probably gonna be arriving half dressed or changing the parking lot. So it's not necessary to really ask if that's an option. Uh, mm. some, some coaches might offer it, but we're gonna be changing in the parking lot or arrive half dressed. But it's, it's, it's just a basic outline Here's who I am, here are my partners are. We're gonna be arriving on campus at this time. We'll be on the field at this time. This is when the game administrators meeting will take place. Looking forward to it. Let us know if there's anything, any changes to the schedule. Go ahead, Alan. Gene, I was just gonna say, especially to the older officials, to let the younger officials know if there's something weird at any of the schools, like we all know who've been repping JP2, if it's whatever the temperature is, it's always colder there because of the way the field is set and the lake and the wind, you know, let people know that, yeah, it might look like it's a short sleeve shirt day, but when you get there, it's like 10 degrees, usually colder there. And so you may be doing long sleeves and that's why you bring everything because there's those weird establishments that, that weather really affects. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, uh, things like that that need to be in the conversation you have not in the email to coaches uh, that's something the coaches should already know uh, so if you're going to talk about the game about what to prepare for text your partners or send a separate email to your partners yeah i meant just with the official between the officials yeah but yeah absolutely between the officials uh like for instance uh where centennial high school plays that field is always a dust bowl so it's it's be prepared to have really dusty feet. So it, everyone knows a, a little bit of something about each field. So having that open line of communication with uh, your officials before the game starts would be very, very beneficial. Uh, Dean said for me to go ahead and show a um, where you can locate the uh, information for your coaches. So if you go into, well, let, me, let me go to my officials portal. I'll click on schedule. So for example, here's this game right here. So this is a game where I was assigned to right here. I know it's Briarcrest, but it hadn't been added in there yet. If I click right here, this is the, the actual assignment number. So this will pull up myself and my two partners on the game. This is where it'll pull up. Now under game notes, it shows the home team is Ravenwood and the away team is going to be a Briarcrest. But if I click right here on Ravenwood, it pulls up the coaches, the contacts for this game. It also pulls up the location of the site. So Briarcrest should, would be right here. And I could click on that and it would show the contact for the Briarcrest game as well. Um, but th yeah, this is where you will locate your site with the address your home team and your away team. And if you click on those, it'll show you where to con the, uh, the uh, contact information for your coaches. Now I've already called the coach of Ravenwood and let him know uh, what's going on with this game, but you're sending the email. That's where you're going to find that information. Got some more people asking some questions. Uh, to clarify, we are to contact coaches for high school games only, or do we do this for middle school as well? Uh, I think we're going to discuss that at our state meetings. I know, I know we're going to do it for high school, middle school. I'm not exactly sure yet. <clears throat> is there any way to tell who the head coach is if there are multiple contacts listed for the team? Un unfortunately, not that I'm aware of. So if I click on Ravenwood, I know Alan Garner is the head coach. I know this lady, she's the head of the president, the parent association. And this guy I think is the, the AD that there's, really not a way to know. Now, if you can go into your lists and under your lists, you can go to teams and that's where I can actually search, like I'll search Ravenwood. So here's Ravenwood, it just lists the contacts. So if I click on contacts, it shows the exact same thing. There's really not a good way to know. It might take a little, just a little more research on your end as the referee just looking up the team, Googling them and finding out who the head coach is. But more than often, more often than not, the first person listed is the head coach of the team. 
when you pull up the contacts for that team. First person listed. Does anyone else have uh, anything extra to add or have any more questions before we move on? Okay, uh, I will be holding a Arbiter Sports training of how to go through it if you're new or want more information about it uh, in the very middle of February. So it'll help out with uh, knowing a little bit more about it. Okay, pregame responsibilities. Communicate with your partners by telephone 24 to 48 hours before the game starts. Confirm the time and location of the game. Confirm the time and location of your pregame meeting. And confirm consistent uniform. I, I cannot tell you how many games I've had with, with Alan Emling where I'll call him or text him and say, hey, what are we wearing for, uh, for tomorrow's game? And the first thing he says, we're wearing pants. <laughs> so like, just texting your partners and having that open line of communication with your partners is very, very vital. And the other thing is an email must be sent out by the referee to the home and away coach at least 24 hours in advance and CC your partners on the email. Partners are not going to be responding to coaches let the referee respond to coaches if they have they send an email back let the referee have that conversation the umpire and field judge should not be having this conversation with the coaches let the referee handle it uh the basic more important terms the in home is the first or starting starting attackman on first man or starting attackman on the roster He'll serve the penalties against the team that are not assigned to a specific player like a coach or any time serving foul called against the coaching staff. <clears throat> the wing areas are the areas in the outside of the box. A player in possession, I've mentioned this in every single training so far, is a player who has control of the ball in his cross and is able to perform normal functions of control like carrying, cradling, passing and shooting. And a flag down term used by officials to indicate that there is a time serving foul flag down basic dimensions of our lacrosse field. Now this is the non-unified field dimensions. So a lacrosse field is 110 yards long. A unified field is a 120 yards long. This is something that we need to know in our pregame. Uh, I know that what Page High School, Oakland High School, uh, I think Brentwood uses a unified field. This is something we need to know before the game starts. So when we walk on the field, we know it's a unified field, which means it's 120 yards long, or we know it is a lacrosse field 110 yards long. So at the meeting site. So when the, all the officials are at the site, the designated referee for the game should lead a pregame meeting. How long that meeting lasts, it'll be longer at the beginning of the season and shorter as the season goes on but we must have a pregame before the game occurs. We're gonna review any new rules for the year and the rule expectations for the game. This is where veteran officials will come into play. If you've had the team earlier in the season and there's a hot head on the team, number 44, the deep hole for, uh, for so-and-so team is a hot head and I've, I've given them multiple uh, defenseless player fouls throughout the season. That's something that we need to discuss in the pregame. What are our mechanics for that defenseless foul? Uh, discuss any pertinent information, such as the field, unified or non-unified, the teams, the coaches, the weather. If, if we know one of the assistant coaches loves to yell across the field, let's know how to handle that before it occurs. And the next thing is the weather. You know, it looks like it might rain during halftime. Let's be ready for that. Review our field mechanics. Where are we supposed to be on the field? Who, what's the uh, procedure for watching the shooter? What's the procedure for the goals? What are the referee's expectations for his partners on the game? Review the level of play and any modifications for the contest. This is where we need to have that conversation. Hey, I had a middle school game last, now I'm at JV. What are the rule differences? If we're doing a division two lower end high school game, are we going to be a little less lenient when it comes to foul adjudication? Or are we gonna be a little more strict? Uh, is there an acting trainer? 
And where's the location of said trainer on the game? Where's the location of the game admin? That game admin, we need to be able to get in contact with before the game and have access to during the game. Biggest thing with that game admin that we need to talk to the admin before the game starts. How do we get in contact with you if the referee calls for you? Uh, for example, we might have one game admin at a, at a uh, school looking over four or five different games going on. So what's your phone number? How do we get in contact you, with you? If we have an ejection, it's your job as the game admin to handle that ejection and getting that person off the field. How do we get in contact with you? Well, we don't have to wait five minutes for you to come and get this person off the field. The next thing is I black. I black is legal in high school, but they're only allowed to have one stripe on their face. They are not allowed to have Braveheart face paint on their face. How are we gonna handle that? Part of your pregame should be checking for this eye black, looking at players' faces. Are they, are they have visors on? Do they have eye black on their face? What are you going to do if the eye black comes into play during the course of the game? The other thing is, is just like you know as well as I do, eye black will run on their face. If they have legal eye black at the beginning of the game and all of a sudden it runs down their face, we're not gonna call them for illegal eye black. It's called sweat, it's natural. So remember with eye black, they're allowed one stripe underneath their eyes, the eye black cannot have words on it or letters. So it's one stripe. They can't do the, the stripes going down their cheeks. It's right underneath their eyes. If you see it, tell the coach, tell them to take it off. Simple as that. Then we don't have to worry about it during the game. Uh, preparation with the table, the table personnel. The home, oh my God, home TAM, home team must provide the official timer and the official scorekeeper. Identify who will perform these roles and talk to them before the game occurs. You might have a mom out there who's never done it before. Walk her through the process. Who's gonna be doing this? Who's gonna be doing that? See if they have any questions. Check for the scorekeeper and the timekeeper experience, just like I just mentioned. And then check the clock. Is it operational? Is it a visible clock? Will the scoreboard clock be used or will the time be kept at the table? If a scoreboard clock is used, does the scoreboard have an operational horn that goes off at zero? These are things we need to know. Because if we get down to zero and all of a sudden there's no horn and then there's a goal scored and it's a non-visible shot, non-visible clock, we might have a problem. These are things we need to discuss with our table personnel before the game occurs. So things we need, we need a visible scoreboard. It could be the flip chart. It could be a scoreboard that's at the one end of the field. We need an operational horn. We need some kind of clocking device and a clock to keep our um, penalties and then someone to keep the score on the field. Check for these before the game starts. It will alleviate headaches if these occur. Now, Remember to also tell your table personnel that the horn needs to go off at the end of every single quarter. And if they have a problem for them to double tweet that horn, let's say the clock stops working, double tweet the horn. We'll, 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 we'll go through the situation once we have a problem, but let them know what they need to do to get in touch with you on the field. Pre-game. A guide. The referee shall conduct a pregame with all officials in the game. The pregame shall consist of the following points. The 2021 points of emphasis and policies, including the COVID policy. Game logistics. Points of emphasis, mechanics, special, special situations, and then our coverage on the game. Our 2021 points of emphasis should include our COVID policies. If you guys did not participate in the COVID policies training, the COVID policies video is up on the TNLOA YouTube page. We are required as officials to wear a face covering in the entire pregame. When we are walking towards the field, when we're on the field, 
we have a face covering on. When the game is taking place, we are, do not have to have a face covering on. You can if you would like, but it's not required. During all dead ball situations, that includes stick checks, timeouts, we must have a face covering on. When uh, all the officials are together checking sticks, we have to have a face covering on. We have to maintain that policy. Don't get lazy and frustrated because you're wearing a face covering. Let's be transparent. All the coaches have also seen this. It was sent to the entire state. They know what we're doing. So if they see someone not doing it and they have a problem, you as the official are going to be the one that hears it. Uh, the other points of emphasis, quick restarts. When and where do they apply? And I want to use this as an, as an opportunity for you guys to chime in. So quick restarts. Someone unmute and tell me the, the mechanics for quick restarts. No one? Okay, so the quick restart mechanic. We are allowed to restart the ball when the defense is when the defense is within five yards. If the defense is within five yards on a quick restart, they must give the uh, offensive player a uh, clear path to the goal. Now, if the offensive player veers into the defensive player, that is the offensive player's fault. If the defensive player is not trying to play him, but within five yards, the defensive player cannot play him. And then he has to gain a five yard bu uh, buffer before he can play him. The other thing with quick restarts is no offensive player is allowed to be within five yards of the person restarting the ball. Those are our quick restart mechanics. <sighs> Next part is timeouts entitled to or not entitled to. Remember at the high school level timeouts can be called by anyone in possession of the ball anywhere on the field. They do not have to be on their offensive half of the field. This is not college. They can be anywhere on the field, but they must possess the ball. If we hear the words timeout, you must blow your whistle. We're not gonna be uh, uh, fluffy with it. So if you hear a timeout call, blow your whistle. We'll figure out after the fact if they were entitled to it or not entitled to it, especially if you're an official on the other side of the field and plays on the opposite side of the field. You hear a timeout, blow your whistle. If the officials look over and you're signaling timeout and they say, who called it? And they say, Blue called it. Well, they didn't have the ball. Red had it. We have an illegal procedure. They were not entitled to the timeout. The other team's going to pick up the ball. That's the way it works. Next thing is the illegal cross. Illegal cross penalties. We did this last year, but we didn't get a whole lot of games in. Illegal cross penalties now are two minutes non-releasable and sportsmanlike conduct fouls for all stick penalties. Uh, hey, ma make sure your mic is muted. Uh, for all penalties, they are two minutes non-releasable, unsportsmanlike conducts, but the stick can return to the game. No more are we going to be setting a um, – no more are we going to be setting a – hold on a second. No longer are we going to be setting a uh, stick on the table because it is illegal. They're allowed to fix their crosses. So if we find a stick that's illegal, it's too pinched, uh, the ball doesn't come out, has a deep pocket – they will all be two minute penalties, but he can fix it. Now also remember that hanging uh, strings, strings that are too long, strings that are longer than two inches or a illegal butt end, those penalties can be fixed. We're not gonna immediately adjudicate a penalty for hanging strings and a bad butt end. We're gonna tell them to fix it. If they don't fix it, now it can become a stick penalty. Next part is equipment inspections. For the 2021 year, there are new rules for the goalkeeper chest protectors. They must meet the SEI ND200 NOXIE standard. You can find, if you have to look into a goalie's equipment to see if he has one that's legal, it's on the tag. 
Now, we're not going to go digging through goalies uh, equipment to make sure they're legal. This is something we're going to ask the coach. Coach, are all your players legally equipped by rule? That includes the new goalie chest protector. If the goalie does not have this, the game will not start. Period. If he can get the, if he can get the chest protector, we'll play the game. If he can't, we're not playing this game. That, that's how it's going to work. Uh, the next part of the points of emphasis is throwing the cross. A player cannot throw their cross towards the player, the ball, or any other people on the field. It is a, between a one-minute and a three-minute releasable unsportsmanlike conduct. If a player throws their stick chasing a ball after a shot and they throw their stick, that is illegal. Throw the penalty flag, give them a one minute unsportsmanlike conduct foul. But it is a releasable penalty. We're just going to add up as an unsportsmanlike conduct foul. Our position assignments is the next part of our pregame. Who's taking the first face off and what's the rotation if we're in the three man game? Going over that procedure is very, very important. Remember, the referee on the game will take the first face off of the game. And then we rotate after that. If we're in the two-man mechanic, the referee will start on the far side of the field away from the benches. And the second half will rotate to the near side of the field. In the three-man game, the referee will take the first face off. The umpire will be the, uh, uh, the helper on the face off, the lead left. And then the field judge will be our wing official. And then we'll rotate based on who scores the goal. The pregame administrator meeting, the referee is going to be the only person responsible for the pregame administrator meeting. I've had uh, some officials say, well, we should have another official in there. We're not going to. It's only going to be the referee. He will be the only one involved in the pregame administrator meeting. So with that being said, what are the other, uh, what's the other official doing? What are the other two officials doing during the pregame administrator meeting? You're talking to the table personnel making sure that they know what they're doing, making sure that they have a horn, making sure that the scoreboard works, who's keeping the time, who's doing the penalties, who's keeping the score, who's keeping track of penalties. So are the other officials are talking to the table, doing stick checks if they're needed while the pregame administrator meeting is taking place. Uh, the pregame instructions, again, who's talking with the table? Do we have uh, legal balls ready for the game to start? checking the goals and walking the field. When we get onto the field, we need to look around, see what the field conditions are. Um, is there mud in certain places? Is there a giant puddle? Is there a hole that they filled in with sand? Uh, is one part of the field in worse shape than the other part of the field? Uh, when are we going to check the goals? And this, what, this needs to happen every game at every level, middle school through high school. Once the teams are about ready to start, when we get down to zero, if the teams aren't already out in the field, we need to check, the, check both goals, make sure there's no extra balls in the goals, make sure there's no holes in the goals, check the goals. What are our timeout procedures? Where do we stand? Are we gonna do stick checks during timeouts? We are doing stick checks, middle school through high school, every single game, no matter the level of play. It could be a blowout game. We're still doing stick checks. We need to get stick checks in. Middle school coaches want their team sticks to be checked. We are going to check sticks at the middle school level. We're not going to be lazy officials and not st check sticks for a, a seventh grade game. What happens if they've been playing with an illegal cross for three years and all of a sudden they get to the high school level and the first time their, their stick is checked, it's illegal. Where it's been legal for three years because no one's checked it. That's our fault. We're checking sticks. What are our halftime procedures? Where do we go? What do we do? Are we gonna go and stand next to the table? Are we gonna go out in midfield and have another, uh, another discussion? What are we doing? Uh, next thing is our overtime procedures. Okay, let's make sure we're, we're muted, fellas. What are our overtime procedures? What are the rules for overtime? What's our positioning? Who's taking the first face off on an overtime? And it, do we have a penalty carryover? What do we do? if we have a penalty carryover into overtime. 
And then our post-game procedures, leaving the field immediately. Remember this year, we're not doing a lineup where the teams are going to shake hands. They can rah, rah, shish, boom, ba all they want, but they're not doing a lineup. Once the, the game is over, walk over the table, get the, get the items you brought onto the field and leave the field. Next part of pregame is our mechanics. Cover positioning mechanics as the referee with your partners. One of the best uh, pregames I've ever participated in, the referee literally asked the other people had, had them prepare things for the pregame. Hey, I want you to talk about positioning in the pregame. Awesome, got it. So he handed it over to one of the other officials. Let's talk about positioning. Where are we gonna be? Are we in the two man or three man mechanic? Well, who's, where, where's the positioning for the live ball play? How are we gonna be counting players? Remember, if, when we count players, we always got to check the clock. Our hand signals, going over our hand signals, our boundaries, who has out-of-bounds calls on all of our boundary lines, uh, on our goals, what are we doing? Uh, making sure that we're watching for dead ball fouls on every time we've sworn a goal. Resets. If we ever have a reset of our clearing counts, 20-second count to the 10-second count, what are we doing? Restarts and fouls technical and personal. Remember, we're using the, uh, uh, the, the technique where we're gonna go color, number, penalty, time, and if it's releasable or non-releasable. And then the next part is our substitutions and transitions. This needs to be a really big aspect of our pregame is box coverage. The official coming down the field, what are we looking for in the box? Mechanics, and speaking with coaches, when and where to speak with coaches. So what I wanna do right now is we're about halfway through this presentation. I'm gonna stop the share real quick and I would like for everyone to unmute. And we're gonna talk about a little bit about the pre-games that we've had in the past and um, any things that have been brought up in our pre-games, things that we liked, things that we disliked so that we all can be well aware of situations we've been in. I've already shared one with you guys. I had a referee that told me, hey, I want you to cover, this is a college game. He said, hey, I want you to cover the shot clock. Every rule involved with a, with a college shot clock, I want you to talk about it. Cool. What things do you guys as, a, as referees on games like to bring up in your pregame? What are the most important, like your top two or three things that you like to bring up in your pregames? Well, I'll start, Gene. One of the things that I like to bring up, especially in the beginning of the year, is I always, if I'm the referee, I'm always going to ask anybody, everybody, okay, have you guys had any, these, we talk, you talk about a little bit about, is there a, a wild man on somebody's team? But I ask people, have you had these guys before? Because in, and what's their level of play? Because, you know, one team may be good one year and they were all seniors and the next year they, they're back to barely picking up the ball. If somebody's had that, that's, I think that's something the crew needs to be aware of. So I always ask, anybody had these guys? Is there anything good, bad, or indifferent about them? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's so crucial. And just like what like Alan said, the team the year before might have been a state championship viable team, but all of a sudden they graduated 15 seniors, and now they're left with nothing but freshmen and sophomores. So that's something to think about. We, our level of play or how high we're going to be officiating for this game might be a lot lower than we expect because of how many seniors they graduated. Does anyone have anything else? Well, kind of to that point, once the season starts moving along, let's say, uh, you know, I'm in Chattanooga, so we have Macaulay. I might call uh, a fellow referee who had Macaulay <coughs> before game before and say, Hey, did you, did you have any issues? with this team, what did you see? So we have that going in the pregame. Oh yeah. For, for sure. one, one point, uh, Gene, about emailing to the, to the coaches is if you have a, a team coming from out of state, put in that email that we're gonna be playing under NFHS rules because they might be used to playing under something else. And that way they'll know beforehand bring it up again during the pregame when you're on the field with them. 
So you've given them two notices. Hey, we're playing by these rules. So during the game, they can't just say, well, you know, we play by Texas rules or whatever. Right. Yeah. And Texas, uh, Texas is one where half the state does NCAA and the other half does federation. I know uh, some Florida schools are in that same boat. Same thing with uh, Michigan. Uh, I'm not sure about Virginia, but some teams that travel down here is if you see on your game that you have an out of state team, make sure that we're playing the NFHS rules and not the NCAA rules. Does anyone have uh, anything else to add? Uh, Usually, Um, I bring up in the coaches meeting, I use the old Louis Diaz, out of respect for you, coach, I listen to anything you have to say. I don't mind talking to your assistant coaches or answering their questions as long as they're civil. But you know, you've had teams where everybody on that coaching staff is screaming and hollering at you. And you can help kind of nip that in the bud if you make sure that the head coach understands that you're not going to be yelled at by an assistant coach, kind of a pet peeve of mine, but better to get that out in the pregame that, hey, we're not going to have your assistant coaches screaming at us the whole game. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. (coughs) There's definitely teams all over Tennessee who are very, very guilty of having very, very vocal assistant coaches. Remember, the head coach is going to be the one that addresses us. Assistant coaches, they can if they'd like to. It doesn't mean we're going to listen. So if you have very, very vocal assistant coaches, uh, coaches that are maybe getting out of hand, let the head coach know, hey, you got to control these guys. And like Alex said, using that the Louis Diaz uh, technique of a little bit of proactive management before the game starts. If you want to do something along those lines, you're more than more than welcome to. Uh, I know the more experience you have, the more inclined you are to have those conversations, less experience you have might be a little scared too, and that's perfectly fine. Um, it takes experience to know how to de-escalate certain situations. And de-escalation is why we're referees. It's, we're out there to make sure that they play legally and correctly, but the other half is just de-escalation of really bad situations. All right, let's, let's go ahead and move on. So... We covered our, our mechanics in our pregame. Now let's cover special, special situations. Just uh, like we talked about before, the difference between middle and high school rules. Middle school rules, they have scrum rules. Let's know these scrum rules. Uh, the difference between NCAA and NFHS. Uh, we have lots of referees that do both. <clears throat> so let's make sure we're going to call the NFHS rules. And uh, as mentioned before, if we have teams from out of state that might play uh, NCAA, make sure they recognize we play NFHS. Uh, we need to cover the flag down slow whistle technique and the play on technique, especially with, uh, we have uh, lots of new junior officials this year. Uh, if you have a new junior official on your game with you, cover these, these mechanics with them. The play on technique is one of the hardest techniques to master. And one of the last things that you master as an official is the play on technique. Uh, but it, walk your partners through what your expectations are in the pregame. Stalling. Uh, if we're going to call a team for stalling, well, we're going to lock them in the box. We're going to put one hand up in the air, one hand in the direction of attack and say, get it in and keep it in. If we're going to call this stalling, we're going to make sure we're not going to trap them when calling stalling. Do not trap them in this situation. I know with myself, uh, Alan, Sam, Dean, Alex, uh, uh, all of, all, every official has a, <clears throat> has a different key that they go off of. Uh, I know I like to touch my watch, put my hand over my watch. It's kind of a nonverbal way of saying, hey, we think they're, I think they're stalling. Or even just saying to your partner across the field, hey, what do you think? What do you think? What, what, what do you think's going on? You say, hey, give them one more time around and we'll do something. <clears throat> If we're going to call them for stalling, we're either going to wait for them to be at X behind the goal and then lock them in or make sure they're out of the box before calling them for stalling. Give them an opportunity to get it in the box. Don't call it when they're one foot inside the box and about to step out and all of a sudden now we have an illegal procedure. It doesn't work that way. So let's make sure that we're doing those stalling calls correctly. Someone has something to add? 
Yeah, I was going to say, Gene, a reminder, uh, just a reminder to everybody, um, stalling can happen in the first quarter. Um, you'll hear a coach say, well, you can't call stalling on us till the fourth quarter. Well, that's not right. And if you'll remember, Gene and I had a, a playoff game, and the one team started stalling from the first possession. You remember, Gene, it was um, – Oh, God, yeah. We, we, we put them in the box like one minute into the game. Yeah, I mean, well, it wasn't that quick. Yeah, it wasn't I mean, that fast, but yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, literally within halfway through the first quarter, we call, probably called – we were calling stalling on that team the rest of the game because that was their strategy. They were trying to shorten the game, shorten the other team's offensive possessions, and you've got to recognize that and make sure the crew's on the same page and call it. And what I like to do if I'm the referee – I want to be the one that calls stalling. If somebody else in the crew thinks that it's stalling, you know, get my attention and we'll look at it. But I, as the referee, I want to be the one who's called stalling. But that's me. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's always going to be on the referee's cue whether it needs to happen. You don't need to make that decision on your own. Uh, that's the big thing with communication with, with your, your partners. So the, the U.S. lacrosse rule book states stalling as – it is the responsibility of the team in possession to attack the goal. If they are making no effort to attack the goal or put the ball at risk, they are stalling. Now you can give a team one or a uh, couple times around the goal, but if they're not putting the ball at risk, we need to start thinking about stuff. We don't want to call a stalling if they're substituting. A team could take 30 seconds of substitute. That should be taken out of the, out of the, out of the framework. Um, I know that <clears throat> I've talked to two coaches who believe that if they're, the team is deliberately not attacking the goal and all of a sudden they substitute again, it resets the official's internal count of stalling. Substituting after they've already held position, uh, possession of the ball for two or three minutes does not reset that stalling count that internal clock that we have, of they've had this ball for a long time. It does not reset it when they're, if they're substituting. Uh -uh. They can substitute at the beginning of their possession, <clears throat> but if they decide to substitute in the middle of their possession, it does not reset that internal clock, that internal meter that we use as officials. There's no set time limit on how long a team could have the ball before <clears throat> you start looking at a stalling call. <clears throat> really, we're looking at... <clears throat> Are they putting the ball at risk? That's the biggest thing, putting the ball at risk and attacking the goal. Uh, the next part of that pregame, the special instructions is stalling in the final two minutes of the game. If the team is up by, what was it, four, four goals, more than four goals, they are required to keep it in the box. So if the team is up, what are our mechanics going to be for that stalling call? Next big thing is fight mechanics. If we have a fight on the field, what's going to happen? What is going to occur? Uh, crease coverage and the counts. Remember in a single, in a, a three-man game, the single side official is going to have the 20-second count and the 10-second count. But in a two-man game, the trail is going to have the 20 second count and the lead is going to have the 10 second count. Let's cover that with our officials. Even if it seems elementary, let's still cover it. And then restarts, especially on face-offs. Who's going to restart the ball if we have a face-off penalty? In the three-man mechanic, the person who restarts play on a face-off is the single side official. What about restarts or offsides on an over and back? And then requirements for restart, such as the quick restart. Go over those special instructions with our officials. And then coverage. Coverage, uh, uh, coverage for the following situations for these, the lead, the trail, and this. Uh, I have so many misspellings, I'm sorry. And the single side, which is the three man. Cover transitions, positioning, our coverage, boundaries, restarts, counts, goals, and substitution area box coverage. Cover all of these for every position. If we're coming up as the trail, what do we need to do? If we're the lead, are we gonna worry about the substitution box if we're the lead running down the field on a fast break? Probably not. So who's gonna be uh, covering those? 
the field of play. This occurs a lot, especially in April. If you find that the field is, we can't play on this field. If you think the field is not viable for play, talk with the head coaches, especially if you see that the area in front of the goal is extremely muddy. Talk to the coaches, let them know, hey, there's a hole over on this side of the field. If the field cannot be fixed, like if it's dangerous, if the field cannot be fixed, the game can still be played. Just put it in the game report following the game. Now, when I mean dangerous, well, I have a couple of slides that'll go over that, but a muddy field can still be played on. An icy field can still be played on. Just talk with the coaches and let the coaches know what the, your concerns are. Improper lines on a field is a whole nother situation. Improper lines not fixed shall be an illegal procedure before the game starts and it's no face off, just award the ball to the other team. <clears throat> So if we have, if we find that, that we don't have in lines on the, in, on the field, well, it's an illegal procedure, but we need to fix it. We, we can't have a game take place if we don't have in lines. We, it just can't happen. Now the field of play, <clears throat> it is the responsibility of the home institution, not the referees to determine whether the field is ready for play. It is not our decision. So if we arrive to the field and the field is like, someone's gonna get hurt on the field, there's sprinklers sticking up out of the field and you know, ice everywhere and icicles, blah, 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 blah. It is the responsibility of the home institution to make that call. So do, are we gonna have that occur? Probably not. Are we gonna have muddy fields? Absolutely. So when we get onto the field after our pregame meeting, let's look around the field, walk the field, uh, you know, chat with parents. If we see parents, chat with our coaches, do stick checks, walk the field to see what the field conditions are. So this is a big one. Failure to have a clearly marked center line is an illegal procedure uh, at the start of a game. This picture is a great example of a illegal center field marking. They must have a shadow line running through midfield. Um, uh, Father Ryan's field is a good example of this. They have a shadow line. It's just very, very faint. So if, if we have a 15 yard stretch at the very center of the field where there's no center line, it's going to be very, very difficult for us on offsides calls. If the players can't see where the boundary is for us to call them offsides. Now, this is something you could talk about with the coaches before the game starts. Talk about, hey, coach, we need a line right here. We need a shadow line. This is midfield. If it's on the 30-yard line, that whatever. But the midfield line, that's extremely important. We need a shadow line running through any uh, logos or designs on the field. It's just an illegal procedure. We're going to turn the ball over. So these are things we need to look at in, when it comes to field conditions. We need to look at holes on the field soccer goals, especially on unified fields. Let's make sure those soccer goals are pushed backwards and out of the way. Um, several schools have uh, what the long jump pits, the sand pits right next to the field. Uh, we might even have uh, what, a track running through one of the corners. All of these, the, the games can still occur. We just need <laughs> to let the, uh, let the head coaches know that this is, this is dangerous. And we need to watch out for this. If we have a hole somewhere like right on the sideline, put a cone over it. Make sure the players know it's there. Uh, sprinklers, any kind of field obstruction. This is why we walk the field to make sure that the field is okay for play. Just talk with the head coaches. Remember, if something can be fixed, we're good to go. If we deem it dangerous, then we can go think about something else. The goal inspection. Before the, goal, before the game starts, both goals need to be inspected. A team shall be given ample time to fix any illegal goals. If the goal cannot or will not be fixed, it is a three-minute unsportsmanlike conduct foul on the team. That is a team foul. So holes and, holes and goals happen all the time. Every team has a whole box of zip ties. Let's fix the goal. Let's let the home team fix it. 
Uh, I did have a, an official tell me about a, uh, a football mechanic of keeping a zip tie in their hat of the lining of their hat. I think I'm going to start doing that in lacrosse games too, just to keep a zip tie with me in case there's a hole in a goal. So, but a goal that looks like this one, we cannot use that at all. The ball can pass through it. If we see a hole big enough for a ball to pass through, you will run into a situation where the ball will pass through it. Um, I think Sam DeSalvatore and myself had a game one time and we saw the ball go into the goal and the ball go out of the goal. It found this one tiny hole. We called the goal like we should have, but we had to fix it. It's going to happen. The, those balls travel 80 to 100 miles an hour and a, a hole will occur in a goal. Let's just make sure it's, it's fixed. Um, I did see there was a question. So let me get that question real quick. Uh, Kirby said, for logos on midfield, is there a way that an email can go out to the statewide to remind them before the season to rule and photo examples of illegal issues and how to fix it? But th this is something that the, the coaches <coughs> should already know, number one, but there is a statewide coaches meeting coming up this week. Um, and so, and I know I'm, I'm involved in that. I'm attending that meeting, that Zoom call. And if they don't bring it up, I'll bring it up. Hey, the reason I brought that up is I don't mind reminding coaches when we get there, but some of these fields have had the same logos for the entire time they put in turf. And, you know, some of these younger officials may feel uncomfortable making that call. And, you know, if there's, if there's known a league email went out saying you have to do it, here's the problem, put that shadow line across it and redo it halfway through the season because – the, I mean, it's many of the turf fields. That's where we have that issue. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's always the turf fields where we have the issue. Um, yeah. That, that's in the, in the, the coaches meeting that's happening this week. If they don't bring it up, I'll be sure to uh, be sure to try and bring it up for sure. I appreciate that Kirby. Um, so just make, look, biggest thing, make sure we're inspecting the goals before the game starts. The other thing is just making sure all balls are out of the goal. Sometimes they forget that there's a ball in there. And if that ball pops out in the field of play and we have multiple balls on the field, we got to kill it. We don't want to ruin a, a scoring opportunity because there's multiple balls on the field. Spectators. So this is, a, this is a, a, a big thing on my list is making sure that spectators are far away from the sideline six yards away from the sideline. Now with middle school games, this will happen a lot. And I know myself as a referee, I like to run outside of the field of play when I'm transitioning up the field. I don't want to trip over a spectator. I also don't want a spectator to get the most 4D experience and have a player dive into their lap. So push them back. This is something we need to check before the game. Uh, if we're at a field complex where uh, there's no grandstands, there's no risers, there's, there's nothing for players to sit on, fans to sit on, they're just going to sit in chairs. Push them back. Just say, move back. Hey, I'm, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your safety. Can you move back, please? Just push them back. Um, no, they shouldn't argue with you at all. Just be polite, kind, and courteous. This is a picture from a summer league tournament. Summer leagues uh, tournaments are wrought with spectators literally having their feet going across the, the, the sidelines. Just push them back. Just you're worried about their safety, push them back. And you don't want to trip because if they interfere with you, now we have a situation. Plus keeping them back away from the sideline can help alleviate situations going through the game if we have a high tense uh, situation on the field. Um, the other thing with spectators, is all spectators either need to be behind a barrier or on the opposite side of the benches. No spectators, not even media personnel can be behind the inline. They can't just sit the back there behind the inline. No, that's a safety issue. Push them to the sideline, make them go over there. Um, the only people that can be standing at, at, behind the inline at any point is if they're behind a barrier or some teams have middle schoolers uh, shag balls. They, if, if you have any uh, young players shagging balls on a game, 
make sure that they have a helmet on. Make sure they're protecting their self. If you see it during the course of a game, tell them to move. I've told, yelled at photographers to get away, move away, move away, move away. And if they refuse to move away, now we have a delay of game. We could have a delay of game situation against the home team. So let the home coach know, hey, tell your photographer to move. If he doesn't move, we're going to take the ball away from you for a delay of game penalty. No one can be behind the end line. It's a safety issue. Hey, Gene. Yeah, go ahead. Um, also, with photographers, ironically, not last year, but the year before, I had three games where photographers were becoming very verbal fans or trying to tell kids what to do. And during one, I think it was at halftime or, or, or so, I just went to the photographer and said, which team are you for? And I said, are you the photographer? And that, of course, I was just establishing who, what they were. And they said, yes. And I said, all right, if I hear from you again, you're gonna be ejected because either you are a photographer or you're a fan. If you want to be a photographer, do your job. If you want to be a fan, get in the stand. And they shut up the rest of the time. Yeah, it, it, it's sound advice. Um, uh, fans are, are allowed to yell for their team. That's perfectly fine. But a, a photographer is, is kind of uh, is allowed to be closer to the field than fans are. So if you have photographers acting as fans or acting as coaches, it, it, it's number one, it's not right. And number two, it's illegal. So they need to move and they need to designate what their role is on the field. If they're a coach, well, they need to get over in the coach's box and stay in the coach's area. They can't be a photographer and a coach and give their kids uh, advice on the field from a different location on the field. Okay, the coaches certification and game administration meeting. The game administration meeting will take place at midfield. The referee shall inform both coaches when the meeting will start in the email sent at least 24 hours before the contest. The referee will be the only official in this meeting and will include both teams head coaches, one team captain from each team, and the home team game administrator. This is part of the coaches evaluation form for, a, uh, for officials and is a requirement of each contest at every level of play. Yes, there is a coaches evaluation form for officials this year. It is based on the Likert scale, a one through five ranking for a crew. It is not a requirement for coaches to fill out this evaluation form, but it's available to them. So if a, if a pregame administrator's meeting does not take place and they write it down the evaluation form, you as the officials are going to be receiving a phone call about it. Um, when, uh, so just make sure it occurs. I think that's the biggest thing. This is the first season for us doing it. Keep that, go, uh, keep that going. So this is a slide I showed uh, earlier in the, uh, in the training season of the responsibilities for the pregame uh, game administrator's meeting. So we have the referee, team captain from each team, head coach from each team, and then the game administrator. The team captains need to stand closest to the referee. Coaches are on the opposite side. So I'll go for the referee's uh, description first. Only the referee will participate in the career game meeting. He'll introduce himself and then continue the introductions. Uh, no handshake will take place during the game administrator's meeting. Following the game administrator's speech, the referee will certify home coach and then the away coach. Uh, the referee will ask about any pregame activities such as an anthem or a prayer so that both, head both the uh, away coach also knows. And the referee will commence with the coin toss procedures following that. Um, the referee will rotate all involved just like a regular coin toss to have their backs to the goal they're defending first and third. The game administrator uh, will give any additional policy notes for the home institutions, as well as you as the official, making help, helping them understand that they will be responsible for handling ejections or fan, uh, anything that happens with spectators on the field. That's the game administrator's job. 
Um, the away team will have their backs to the bench. The home team will have uh, that will be facing the bench. The other officials are, who are not participating, they don't need to be standing in these locations like in this diagram. But what they need to be doing is checking sticks if kids want their, their sticks checked, talking to the table, going through those mechanics that were discussed in the pregame with the referee. So like I said before, the referee is going to be doing his introductions, no handshakes. Game administrator will, will give their little spiel if they have one, certify both head coaches, then go through your uh, coin toss procedure with all involved. When you certify your coaches, you are going to ask them, do you certify your players are legally equipped by rule? In that understanding, by asking him that questions, you are asking him if the players all have legal equipment, including the goalie, and the players are wearing their equipment properly. So if we run into a situation on the field, it's technically the coach's fault that his players are illegal because he told us they were legal. If the coach ever answers no to that question, the game cannot start. It has never happened to me. I've never had a coach say, no, I do not certify my players. I've never had that. But if they do say it, the game cannot commence. All players must be legally equipped. Confirm with the head coach if any of these occur. Is there a scene? <laughs> what issues do we have with the field? Anthems, prayers. Uh, Father Ryan, I know, does a prayer before every single game. Uh, is there anything happening at halftime? Uh, do you understand the duties of the game administrator? And are there repair kits for the goals, like zip ties or string? The game administrator is responsible for communicating policies of the home institution, if they want to add, uh, escorting ejected players and coaches or fans from the playing area, and escorting the officials from the play area, play area if it's needed. I, I, I've never run into a, a situation where I had to be escorted off the field, but if we're in a high tense situation, the game administrator needs to help us off the field. The coin toss mechanic, this is a normal coin toss mechanic for the three man, but the coin toss in a non COVID policy year will involve all the officials and the captains for each team. The referee will ask the players to shake hands. He'll show the coin heads and tails to both speaking captains. The speaking captains will be closest to the referee. He'll ask the away team to choose heads or tails. He'll toss the coin in the air and catch it. Do not let the coin touch the ground or flip the coin over on the back of your hand. Just toss it up and catch it. We're not doing the football mechanic where some officials will let the coin hit the ground. Just catch it in your hand. It's not necessary. So, but the coin toss of, of catching it in the air, not letting it drop on the ground, not flipping it over your hand, we're still going to use that, that mechanic this year. This is just a basic outline of a non-COVID policy year. Uh, for the anthem, uh, players line up like they normally will on a game, but where are we going to be when the, if, the, if they do a national anthem? Are we going to be at midfield? Are we going to be on the sideline where all the coaches and uh, uh, players are? Talk about this in the pregame. Where are we going to be if we have an anthem? Uh, it's, it's something that is, is very important. And as officials, it's for all of us to do the exact same thing. Uh, Scott said, I've had a coach respond, I think so, to the legally equipped question, question, and that is not acceptable. It must be a yes or no. Correct. If you have a coach that says, well, I think so, coach, yes or no. You know, he's most of the time, like Scott probably knows, he's probably joking. Well, I, I, th I hope they are. It, it, it needs to be a yes or no question. Yes or no. So the lacrosse scorecard, let's go over this real quick. So our lacrosse scorecard, you can use an NFHS one or an NCAA one. This is an NCAA scorecard. I like using these because if a kid wants a quick stick check, I can stick this scorecard into his stick and know if it's legal or illegal. We're gonna write the names of the teams on the top of the card. Just write the color, blue, red. If you wanna be super fancy and write BHS, OHS, uh, FRA, whatever. You want to be fancy, write blue or red. Myself, if I hold my scorecard up to, uh, and I'm looking at the benches, if I'm on midfield and I'm looking at the benches, I'm writing blue because they're the team on the left-hand side of the field. I'm going to write red because they're the right-hand 
they're on the right hand side of the field. That's how I've always done it is blue and red. Next thing, we're going to get the names of the captains. Now, we have, uh, I have three captains on one team, two captains on the other team. They can have as many captains as they want, but only one captain is going to be participating in the game administrators meeting. So if you have, if the coach says multiple captains, that's perfectly fine, but only one of them, their speaking captain is going to be participating in the coin toss this year. Next thing we're going to get is their in-home. The in-home is going to be a starting attackman uh, who is uh, the first listed person on their roster, who's the in-home. Uh, we want the starting attackman because if it's going to hurt a little bit more if the coach gets a penalty. After we do the coin toss and the uh, teams have a choice of what goal they're going to, what goal they're going to defend mm -hmm. or alternate possession, we're going to circle that arrow. In this instance, red has the first alternate possession. So I'm going to circle that they have that first alternate possession on the field. When we write down goals scored, because we have first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, we need to make sure that we circle our numbers. We're going to write down the number of the team that scored. We are not, however, going to be doing this. Don't do the tick marks. Let's keep track of who has scored our, our goals. Uh, as officials, if we're in a two-man mechanic, there's always one guy watching the shooter. If we're in a three-man mechanic, there's always two guys watching the shooter. We should know who scores these goals and communicate it. Hey, it was number 20. Hey, that was number one. Write down number one and circle the number. Don't do the tick marks. Use numbers whenever we're writing down goals. Next big thing is our timeouts. When we write down our timeouts, we need to write the time that the timeout occurred on the field. If we have a timeout in the first quarter, we're gonna say, okay, he took his first one in the first quarter and there was 840 remaining. He took his second timeout in the second quarter with 225 remaining. They only get two timeouts per half. So uh, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry. I should be on mute. <laughs> no, like I said, um, like I said, I'm at work, so I'm trying to do both things here. No, you're good, Mike. No worries. Um, with the, we always want to write down the time of our timeouts because if the coach says, no, I've only taken one. No, coach, you took one with 840 in the first quarter and you took the second one with 225 in the second quarter. You only have this many timeouts. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure that you're writing down the time of all these timeouts. Let do this real quick. Okay. Uh, I gotta go back through this whole thing again. Um, after our timeouts, the back of our card, we don't use incredibly often, but when we do use it, it's very, very critical to us. Our unsportsmanlike penalties that we have during the course of a game, we need to write down on the back of our card. In this instance, I have blue number 30, got an unsportsmanlike conduct a three minute and it was an ejection. I'm gonna write that down because anytime we're gonna write down our penalties for unsportsmanlike conduct fouls, the referee is responsible for putting those into the post-game report and arbiter. The post-game report must consist of any unsportsmanlike fouls, defenseless player fouls and targeting fouls. We have to put those three into our post-game reports. Hey, Gene, should you not like, note the time uh, when those fouls occurred from the report? Uh, yeah, you can you can put them in. Um, I I don't know if I ever have put it in uh, like a specific time. I'll say player was ejected in the third quarter. Okay. Or player was ejected in the second quarter. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Gene, don't forget we also got to write down ejections. Right. Yeah. The, the ejections for sure. So whenever you are writing it down. So like I have right here is I have an unsportsmanlike conduct three minute and I wrote down EJ as a dejection. So we're, we're writing down all of these fouls back here. Now we could have an, un, an unnecessary roughness penalty 
That's not an unsportsmanlike conduct foul. That is a defenseless player. We still need to write those down, defenseless player and any kind of targeting fouls, because we have to put those into our post-game report. Oh, goodness. A uh, little bit of a, of, a, of a video. If it decides to load up, of course it would do that. So this is just standard gameplay for some pregame procedures that take place before the game. So we have, I think it's blue and blue and red, if I'm not mistaken. And so before the game starts, teams are hopping each other up. What are we doing at this point as officials? Are we already in our positions? Are we on the sideline? What's, what is occurring during all of this? So we have the two officials who are in the middle of the field and they're gonna conduct the lineup which is that starting players of each team, we're not doing a lineup this year, but this is what the lineup looks like. Players shake hands. We're not doing the shaking hands lineup this year. So basic pregame procedures before the game starts. Uh, at, for the COVID year, once the game is ready to start, players are just going to proceed to their immediate starting positions. We're not going to do our uh, lineup procedures we did last year. First face off. Remember this year with face offs, we're not touching players. We're also going to have the ball already on the ground for our face offs this year. We're not going to place the ball down. Again, not touching crosses. We're going to be backing out before we ever say the set call. And just be well aware, all the coaches have seen what we're doing. So if we have deviations from that, the coaches can have problems with it. So we have to maintain our consistency with uh, our face-off procedures this year. So that that's it for our pregame procedures training, for, for our pregame procedures. Um, I want to open it back up for a little bit more discussion on the pregame, but I also want to also, I also want to get into uh, some dead ball mechanics. I've covered this with a couple of people already, but uh, I would like to cover again, dead ball mechanics and fight mechanics. So uh, for the uh, last 30 minutes of the training, go pretty quickly through it, but does anyone have anything else to add on pregame procedures for this year, pregame meetings, or um, what's going to occur before the game, during halftime, and what's going to occur after the game. All right. No questions. Hey. I like it. Yeah, go ahead. Who's going to make the determination, uh, maybe if there's a thunderstorm? So lightning, those kind of things. Game administrator? It, it is the home institution's responsibility to make that call. Now, if, I mean... I'm, I'm as guilty of it as anyone. We hear thunder, we, we merely throw, put up a red flag. But remember, there's specific thunder and lightning rules in place, and it's the home institution's responsibility to keep track of that. Um, I know that most, most home institutions have a lightning detector, or they can look on their phone and figure out where lightning strikes are. Um, it is the home team's responsibility, home institution's responsibility, to uh, make that call. Uh, if we do make that call in the middle of a game, we'll delay the game and then start the game after the delay takes place. <clears throat> uh, two seasons ago, I ran into a situation where the game was delayed an hour. <clears throat> it's, it's one of the risk factors of being a referee. Sometimes we have to be there longer than we expect. <laughs> but uh, we'll also make that determination with both coaches. If both coaches want to call the game, both coaches need to agree on it. So if we have a big thunderstorm rolling through and, and it's going to be a couple of hours of lightning and it's now nine o'clock and they want to go ahead and call the game, we can call the game. The team, if we call a game for weather like that, it'll be a 1-0 score for whoever's in the lead if we call a game like that. So, but if that ever occurs, put in your post-game report, let the assigner know that we called the game due to, due to weather and uh, we'll go 
through that process uh, after the game takes place. But yeah, it, both both coaches need to agree if we're going to ever call the game for any kind of weather situation. Does anyone else have anything else before I get into some dead ball, dead ball fight mechanics, which is the kind of the big thing. You might want to cover any safety issues on the field. Uh, what, how do you mean? Uh, such as going to Macaulay. Uh, they've got the shot put area down in one of the corners of the field. You know, what are you going to do if the ball comes loose there and they're trying to play it? it you normally will award it by alternate possession or whatever. <clears throat> So that's one of those things we have to talk about before the game starts. So if they have a shot put area in the back of the field and there's like, what is it, like that concrete circle and the netting and that kind of thing, that's something we'll talk about before the game starts. So if we ever run into a situation as officials where we deem that the players are now in danger, if the ball is loose and we blow our whistle, we're going to award that via alternate possession. If we deem it dangerous, um, I did a Laredo training uh, like six years ago, seven years ago now, where I had a player's stick break. Happens, happens a lot in lacrosse, sticks break. But when the stick broke, it went straight into the ground and was sticking up with the pointed end up. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I let play continue as long as I could. But as soon as the play started coming towards that stick, I blew it dead. Now, he, luckily, they still had possession of the ball. I just killed it, and I was reamed for it because I killed it. I'm, I'm, no matter what, I'm not going to let a player impale himself. I just grabbed the stick and restarted the play. But if you deem play dangerous in that instance where there's a shot put area or a long jump sand pit that runs through the back end of the field or they're getting close to it, you can, you can blow it dead if you choose to, but cover that with the coach before the game starts. Hey, if play is getting down here, we have a scrum down here right next to that. And if, if I deem it, it's getting dangerous, I might kill it. Just let them know beforehand. But as long as it's within the, within the field of play, like there's a big difference between an obstacle being in the field of play and the obstacle being out of the field of play. If we have a long jump pit that's a yard off the field and there's a big loose ball situation that's on the field, we're going to let that play continue because it's not a danger to really to the people on the field. It's the danger to them running off and getting hit off the field. But you can make that determination with the coaches beforehand on what you're going to do if the situation arises. That's just something we just had to talk to them about. Hey, we got the shot put circle down there right on the corner. Uh, we got the net that's right butting up to the end line. If I think it's dangerous and there's a loose ball, there's a chance I might kill it because it's a dangerous situation. Coaches are probably not going to argue with you. If you deem it dangerous, kill it. If it's loose, alternate possession. If someone gains possession, kill it and give it to them. So just do it to maintain player safety. Okay. So dead ball mechanics. I'm going to kind of go through this quickly so that we can get to the fight section of our, uh, of the dead ball. So again, I'm going to kind of go through this. So, uh, so this is an example of, of quick restart. Remember, we talked about this. This is part of the pregame. Red team has possession of the ball. White's playing defense. Great defense. Ball comes loose. Ball goes out of bounds. He awards it to red. Red picks up the ball. White is within five yards which is legal. But they restart and immediately play him within five yards, which is illegal. You're not allowed to play the man within five yards. Biggest thing for out of bounds calls, be in the correct position to make that call. If we're 20 yards away and we don't have the best vantage point, that's our fault and being, the, in, being in the incorrect position. Another example, Hopefully this one will play, but this is management on the restart. So this is probably the worst slashing you will probably see ever in lacrosse, but we have the, the blue team who's playing a loose ball. Loose ball comes up towards the midfield line. Good defense, good defense, hits him in the front, 
perfectly fine. White team takes exception, goes to restart and just slashes him. And slash and slash and slash and slash. This is where us as officials, we have to maintain management and de-escalate the situation. Especially with fans being right next to where it occurs, de-escalate and move on. I'm gonna jump forward to some to our fight mechanics real quick. Uh, I apologize. Let me see. Oh, there it is. Okay. So the last part of the training over fight mechanics. Any player who attempts or deliberately strikes an opponent must be ejected with a three-minute non-releasable unsportsmanlike conduct foul. Even if he whiffs, if he throws a punch, it's an immediate ejection, no matter the level. Um, no matter what. The officials shall freeze the sidelines. The officials shall not interject in the altercation physically. Protect yourself. If you, if you think you need to jump in and try to pull play, uh, uh, players apart from each other, if you want to do that, that's up to you. But understand they also have six foot titanium sticks and you do not have protection on your head or face. So you make that determination. Big thing on the fight mechanic is yelling freeze. Put both your hands up in the air and yell freeze as loud as you possibly can. Uh, I had a junior official that I trained last year. His first game he ever did had a bench clearing fight. He turned around, did exactly as I trained him to do. He was on the far side of the field, turned around, looked at the parents and yelled freeze as loud as he could. But, sorry, my phone's going off. He turned around and yelled freeze as, as loud as he could. And, uh, but the fans still came on the field. Uh, there's only so much you can do when it comes to our, the, the fight mechanic with freeze. Biggest thing is try not to get other people involved in the fight. Oh, oh no, yeah. The, the, the last clip where we saw those slashes absolutely should have been ejections. Absolutely. Uh, Payton says, are we distinguishing between a closed fist or an open hand slap or treating them the same when it comes to fighting? If he, if he wants to wussy slap the kid, it's still a punch. A player who attempts to, because the, the, the way the rule states is it's striking an opponent. Doesn't say closed fist, open hand, it's striking an opponent. Um, if he attempts it, if he connects or doesn't connect, it's ejection. We're not going to be uh, lenient in this. Um, it's something that was that was covered in um, the NCAA new rules book that came out. One of the first points of emphasis in the NCAA rule book says that the image of the sport of lacrosse is at jeopardy because of officials not calling things or giving players too much benefit of the doubt. If you see him attempt to strike or deliberately strike an opponent with a closed fist, open hand, eject them. I guarantee the assigners will back you up on it. If you see them attempt it, eject them. Three minute unsportsmanlike conduct and kick them out. Get the game administrator and escort them off the field. They're gone. It's just the way it works. Uh, it, 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 I'm glad you asked that Peyton, but it, it, it doesn't matter. Open hand or closed fist, doesn't matter. So this, hey, this hey, is Jeannie, a great example of why it's important to freeze the benches. Hey, Jeannie, before you go to that, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had an, uh, this is an example of, I think, of a bad way to do it. I had a, a JV game, and we had the varsity game right after that. There was an official up here from another state who I'm not going to mention. He was the referee. Cluster over by the table. Um, players falling into the, the team area. So there was all kinds of people down. 
two people together, one hits the other guy. I throw the flag, I'm, I call, I go to the, go to the referee, said, so look, he hit him, and he's telling me, no, he didn't. And I said, I was right there, yes, he did. And he refused to do the ejection. Well, ultimately, on film, he did hit him. And it turns out that when we got to the varsity game, that kid who threw the punch was that team's main face-off guy. So allowing something to have happened in the JV game and not enforcing the rule had a huge effect on the up on the following varsity game. So, you know, you can't unfortunately override the referee, but you need to do everything you can if you're not the referee and you see something happen and somehow you're being questioned say, no, absolutely, I saw what I saw. And if I'm the referee, you're gonna, you're not gonna get any crap from me about that. So that was just one bad experience, but about a fight that I think everybody needs to realize that if you've seen it, you've seen it, do everything you can to lobby to get that call. Yeah, and, and as, a, as a referee, <clears throat> if you're the referee on a game and, and one of your partners says that he, that he had a player punch, talk to, talk to them about it, don't be, very closed minded, uh, like that, like what the out, uh, what Alan's experience was. Um, don't be closed minded. You might have seen it from another angle, but if he was closer, back your back your officials up. Uh, I, I've said this in every single training so far. We are the third team on the field. We can't on the field have have big disagreements. You know, maintaining that cool, common, collected aspect is is what's it's part of our professionalism as officials. So if we run into that situation where one person sees something, the other person doesn't talk about it with each other, explain what happened, but back each other up. Uh, there, there's a zero tolerance for fighting in lacrosse. If we have a fight or we have a punch, it's a zero tolerance aspect, especially if one person saw something and the other person didn't back each other up. Um, it, it's just we have to support each other because lacrosse is is a is a finesse sport played by demons. So we we have to back each other up in in every aspect of the game. I appreciate you bringing that up, Alan. And so hey, let me ask you this: Arnold. Go ahead. A uh, player gets ejected in a JV game, and he's playing in the varsity game later that day. Does that varsity game, is that his one game ejection or, or, I mean, how do you handle that between JV and varsity? Say he gets ejected from a varsity game and then they're playing a JV game. Does he have to sit out the JV game as his one game suspension? Or, I mean, how, how does that work? So an, an ejection that, that goes through that, that coach's appeals process and gets sent to the assigners. If we have an ejection in a JV game, right after that game concludes, I'm immediately going to be calling the assigner. But no, I'm not going to let that player play. Um, if he's ejected in that game, if he's in the varsity game, he's not playing in that game. And, and I don't think the assigners would fight you on it if you eject a player for fighting, especially. Um, uh, I had a game two, two, two years ago and had a player <clears throat> punch another kid. The other kid just kind of laughed it off because he was wearing a glove and the other kid had a helmet on, but he punched him and it was in a JV game. And so I did my procedure right after the game was over with before the varsity game. I uh, immediately called the assigner and the assigner agreed he's not playing in the varsity game, not playing. And I said, cool. Um, the, I, the, the assigners are not going to disagree with you. If you say, no, 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 he's sitting this out. Um, because after the fact, it turns out that that player was then subsequently ejected for four more games because of the altercation. So we can't make the determination on how long an ejection will last because that is not up to us. That's up to the association to make that call. But if a player is ejected from a, varsity, a junior varsity game 
and it's supposed to be playing the varsity game. Unless Jeff says something different, I'll, I'll text him and ask him. Uh, he's not playing in that varsity game. And if I'm wrong in, in, in saying that, uh, I'll 100% own up to it and send an email <laughs> uh, saying that I was wrong in that situation. But if a player is ejected for, for fighting, no, they're not playing the next game. Not so he's happy. done for the day. Yeah, he's done. Done, done, done. It's just like in a summer, in a summer tournament. If a player is ejected in the very first game of the, of, of the tournament, He's, he's done for the whole tournament. So for, done at least for the whole day. So he, he's just done. And if the coach argues, that's when you just call the assigner and let the assigner know. So uh, this, this clip's a great example of fans running on the field. We have a couple, a bunch of penalties that occur, and then all of a sudden people jump in. <clears throat> so we have the officials jump in. They're in there. The only thing that, that I would say, let's see, we have the coach running in, and sometimes we get in these high tense situations. Throw the flag, but leave your whistle in your mouth and be as annoying as humanly possible the entire time. And just get right in their ear and just blare, 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 blare down the entire time. Because what we have right here is we have this a huge situation where players are joining in in an altercation. Any player that joins in an altercation is also ejected from play. If they join in, it's a, they're also ejected. So we, it's always kind of that weird situation where we got to talk to each other about what occurs. Now, remember in lacrosse, this might not be a rule that everyone knows, in lacrosse, we can only have a maximum of three players serving a penalty at a time. So if we have that kind of situation where we have multiple uh, fouls on the play, maximum of three players serving a penalty in the penalty box at a time. If we have any more than three players, the fourth, fifth, whatever, if we have a fourth player, that person does not serve their penalty time until the first three are uh, until one of the other ones penalty time is, is done. So if we have three penalties in the box, the fourth penalty that we have, it's not going to serve penalty time until one of those other three uh, have elapsed. But the fourth player is off the field. Correct. The fourth player is off the field. They're not participating in the game. They're on the sideline. So if we have one 30 second penalty and then two, two minute penalties, once that 30 second penalty is over, that player that was serving that fourth penalty, his penalty time will now start. I think it's a very less known adjudication. So here's, here's another example yeah. of, of a lacrosse fight that occurs where the benches get involved. So the game's over, high tense game. We have a red player who's talking to a white player. Watch this number 25 runs in and all of a sudden everyone just surrounds them, punches, punches. And this is following the game. The game's over and we have a fight. Doesn't matter if the game's over. If we have a fight, he's still ejected from the game. And go over to the penalty, the penalty area and adjudicate a penalty. Give him a penalty anyways. Three minute unsportsmanlike conduct, ejection, even if the game's over. As long as we're still on the field, our, adjudic our, our uh, requirements as officials have not ended. We're still officials even after the game's over if we're on the field of play. Adjudicate a penalty as you should see fit. Fights are difficult. It, it's, it's one of the things that, that it stinks about <laughs> the referee and is when we run into a fight on the field, we have to do the best thing to keep the players safe, but also keep yourself safe. Like I said before, uh, if you have a fight on the field, put both your hands up in the air, blow your whistle, and yell freeze as loud as you can. Because as soon as you say freeze, any person who steps foot on the field is immediately ejected. Doesn't matter if you have the leading attackman on one team jump on the field to try to help. It doesn't matter if he's trying to help. If he sets foot on the field, he's also ejected from play. If you have a fan come on the field, they are ejected from play. Every one of those people are going to leave once you deem that the field is frozen. 
any person who sets foot on the field is immediately ejected from the game. If you have an instance where you have, especially near the substitution area box, if you have a fight over there, blow your whistle, throw your flag, and start taking down numbers, especially if you're in a three-man game, freeze the field, pull out your scorecard, and just start looking, seeing who's involved. Because if we have a big scrum of eight players, it might be hard to see the numbers. Write down the numbers if you can. Um, but again, it's, it's not like hockey where we're going to interject and we're going to drop our whistles down on the ice and interject immediately. Hockey referees wear helmets. We don't. Don't injure yourself by getting involved into an altercation. If you, if you want to get involved in a safe manner, do so but it's not required for you to get involved in an altercation. Throw the penalty flag and we'll adjudicate it after the, the whole scenario is completed. So, but like I said before, part of your pregame needs to be talking about that. And what several people have talked about, knowing who's on the field. Midway through the, <laughs> season, the end of the season, we know what the teams are like. We know if they have a hothead on the field. If these two teams don't like each other, and they're gonna try and injure each other. We need to know that before the game starts. So if you have experience with a team, let them know, let the, your partners know what happens. My first game of the season is Ravenwood Briarcrest. If I see a hot-headed player on the team, I'm probably gonna let the other officials know that, hey, there's this player on this team, uh, he's a hothead, watch for him. So you know bef before the game starts who to keep an extra eye on. No, I'm not going to carry this down yet. I'm just getting it out so it's getting full. Um, does anything, anyone have anything else to add? We got about six minutes left in the train. <laughs> we have about six minutes left in the training. Would anyone like uh, me to go over anything else one more time or uh, have anything else to add? I know there are several junior officials in this training right now um, who I would like to stay on the call to talk with them a little bit more. But if anyone has any, uh, anything else to add, I'd love to hear it or have a, uh, something you like to do in your pregame. If you've had a situation arise where maybe you should have discussed something in your pregame mechanic, where uh, if you had discussed it, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, I know my, one of my biggest things is, is talking to coaches. I'm a very talkative person and I'm very demonstrative. Uh, and just as a person, I talk with my hands. I'm, I'm a choir director. I mean, I literally do this all day long. So I talk with my hands. So one thing as an, as an official, if I'm talking with coaches, I put a hand over my mouth and tuck one hand underneath my armpit. So it keeps me from using my hands. It's something I've, I, that I learned from someone else and I've used it ever since, is doing the armpit tuck and putting a hand over my mouth. All of a sudden the other coach can't see what I'm saying and it keeps me from doing this. So, when I talk to coaches, I love talking to coaches. I love talking to fans, but it's knowing when and where it's important to talk to them and knowing when and where you'll get back to them. So if you have a coach that's really, really angry, what are you going to do? As a referee, you need to tell your partners, I don't want you to talk to the coaches if that's what you want them to do. If the coach has a question, talk to them. If they're angry, de-escalate the situation. One of the worst things we can do as officials, and everyone is, is guilty of it, is becoming emotionally involved in a game. We need to stay above that emotional boundary line and not become emotionally involved. So talking to your officials and letting them know. Um, another part of your pregame should be what we're taking onto the field and what we're not taking onto the field. So... Uh, if you want to take a dot kit bag, like one of the little uh, travel carry bags with like extra whistles and an extra timer, scorecards, that kind of stuff, you want to take that on the field, more than fine. But I don't see it necessary to take a whole bag onto the field. Uh, you shouldn't have to. You should be ready before you get onto the field. We shouldn't be getting dressed on the field. Get dressed during your pregame procedure. Um, but yeah. This was, I thought this was a great training and I'm glad everyone chimed in and added some things. Uh, Pre-game is kind of the, one of the things that everyone does a little bit differently. And as younger officials come up, you'll learn stuff that you like and learn stuff that you don't like. 
and pick up on those things. Uh, I know a lot of the veteran officials here in the state, they learned most of the tricks and tricks of the trade from other guys. It, it's hard to reinvent the wheel when the wheel's already been in motion for this long. So if you see something that someone that you like that someone else does, pick up on it and start using that procedure and uh, learn from the officials on the field. And uh, I am always available if you wanna message me or text me if you have questions. I know Ken, uh, Ken Mari likes to text me and ask questions. <laughs> so if, if you have situations or you see something in the rule book where you have a question of, start getting into this, get into this rule book now, get into it. Uh, you should, as officials, it's part of your responsibility to know the rules. And every single time I read the rule book, there's something new that I'm just like, oh, yeah, I definitely should have read that seven years ago because <laughs> it came up in a game. So know the rule book um, and get your, get your eyes into it and start preparing for the season. The first game of the season is in two weeks of the preseason. So games are being assigned right now. Get your blocks in and get ready for it. I think the only other thing I'd like to add is – if you would like to come and watch some preseason games, if you're not assigned, but there's games in your region you'd like to go see, go watch them. Reach out to the officials. If you don't know that if there's games going on in your region, if you want to message me or message your assigner, they'll let, they'll let you know, or I'll let you know, hey, there's a game at Macaulay on so-and-so day. There's a game at MUS on so-and-so day. Uh, here's, the, here's the referee on the game if you want to give them a call and see if you can go out and watch the game and you know participate in their pregame i guarantee no one's going to have a fit if someone wants to participate in my pregame or dean's or alex's like you can you can always ask so uh reach out let's be super prepared for this season it's going to be a weird season with all the covid policies but i know i can speak for pretty much everyone i am so ready for the cross season to start and not last only three weeks <laughs> so hey gene I'm, I'm what are the things back into it Go ahead, if, somebody's, if somebody's coming to watch a game, some of these schools like Ryan and JP2, and I don't know about the other areas of the country, I mean the state, but they charge for people to come in. And if you're coming as an official to observe, just tell them you're an official and you're there to observe the game and they won't charge you. Mm -hmm. Or you can walk in with the crew, just walk in with them. Yeah. And so when, when the crew walks in before the game starts, walk in with the crew and you don't have to get, uh, you, don't, you won't be charged for the game. Just walk in with them. But uh, if you want to go watch a game, you can always text me or text one of your assigners and see what games are available. And, uh, and I'll let you know, and you can call the referee and, and, or text them and say, how I, I want to come see your game. Can I come with you? I, I highly doubt anyone's going to have a problem with that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the training today. If you have any questions of me, you can always uh, text me. I'll put my name into uh, the chat so you guys can have my phone number. Um, if you read anything or see anything on in the rules, you can always uh, ask questions. I highly suggest that everyone goes and looks at our YouTube channel, TNLOA. Um, there's lots of videos for fouls and fouls adjudication and lots of examples of technical fouls and personal fouls. If you want to know what something looks like, go look it up. It's on our playlist section of our, of our YouTube channel. But I appreciate everyone coming in and participating in today's training, and I hope you guys have a great day and a great rest of the weekend. I would love it if uh, our uh, Mason and Will, if you want to stick around, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more. Um, and if anyone else would like to stick around um, and uh, discuss anything else, you're more than welcome to. But other than that, I appreciate for you guys for participating in today's training. And I will, our first, oh, our first state meeting is tomorrow, the 25th of January. If you go in the events portion of uh, Arbiter, there's a link to our, uh, uh, TNLOA state uh, meeting. That's tomorrow at 7 p.m. And the Zoom link is also located there as well. Uh, remember, you have to participate in one of those state training, uh, the state meetings. There's six of them available. Please make yourself available for one of those six meetings. They're all in Arbiter. Uh, and you can pick the date you would like to go. So I appreciate it, fellas. And you guys have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, brother. <laughs>